Okay, we're going to talk about uh, autoimmune disorders. So this is probably about as far uh, opposed to soft tissue neoplasia as you can get. <laughs> so you're going to have to shift gears a little bit. Uh, so what are the autoimmune connective tissue diseases? Well, basically we're talking about a group of diseases where the host's immunity is directed to itself. Uh, generally synonymous with collagen vascular disease, but some people put the auto-inflammatory disease in here. We usually include uh, vasculitis. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of those today and give you more of a morphologic and clinical pathologic approach to making diagnoses. So we don't do too many immunostains here. The only stain that's sort of done in these situations is uh, immunofluorescence. Uh, and these are just some of the categories of these. And yes, you're free to take photos of this and do anything you want to with it, so I have no problem with that. Uh, so let's talk about vasculitis to start off with. And so when you look at the histologic classification of vasculitis, it's really pretty protean. A lot of, depending on who you are, what kind of specialty you are, you're going to use a different type of classification. Uh, the uh, rheumatologists like to use large versus small vessel vasculitis. Some of the rheumatologists will say that the large blood vessels really don't live in the skin at all. Uh, that there really need to be larger arteries and things in, in the organ systems of the body other than the skin. Uh, we also talk about the type of inflammatory response. We talk about the pathophysiology, whether it's leukocytoclastic or whether it's immune complex versus thrombotic. Uh, so we kind of use all of the above, sort of like going to a Chinese restaurant. We'll order different things from different sides of the menu. Uh, but in general, uh, some sort of principles is that vasculitis often tends to get overdiagnosed. People say that if there's just perivascular inflammation, that that's uh, synonymous with vasculitis, it's really not. You really need to have uh, some actual damage of the blood vessel. You need to have fibrin deposition or it's really not truly vasculitis. Urticarial vasculitis, way overdiagnosed. Uh, it's pretty rare. And we see a lot of patients with urticaria we get biopsy and it turns out not to be. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, it may be primary or maybe secondary. And in larger blood vessels, if there's inflammation in that blood vessel at all, it's abnormal. Uh, and then a lot of diseases kind of cause vasculitis. So if a rheumatologist will call you with a patient that has leukocytoclastic vasculitis, so what's the cause? You say, I don't know. You're going to have to look at the patient because it's an end stage reaction of many different things that causes immune complex deposition. So the histologic definition of fully developed small vessel uh, vasculitis is fibrin deposition within the walls or thrombosis within the lumina. You don't have that, you can't say it's really a fully developed lesion of vasculitis. They may still have vasculitis, and I'll talk about how to diagnose that at earlier stages, but if you don't have that, you really can't call it histologically. Larger blood vessels, just inflammation is all you need. And it can be either primary or it can be secondary. So let's talk about LCV. Uh, it's probably the most common uh, form of vasculitis that we see. We get immune complex uh, deposition in most cases. You may or may not have internal and organ involvement. So early on, we'll see petechiae, urticaria, later we see the classic palpable purpura, but you can also get pustules, ulcers, a lot of different morphology. Again, the key features early on, you can just basically see neutrophils with leukocytoclasia and fully developed lesions. Obviously, you'll see uh, the fibrin in the walls of the blood vessel and thrombosis within the lumina. So here we get uh, a case of urticarial lesions of vasculitis. It looks like urticaria. These lesions last longer than 24 hours. Here's ones that are starting a little bit petechial. And then here's the, the histologic findings of a very early lesion. We see lots of leukocytoclasia. We do not see fibrin at this stage of evolution because it's too early to identify the fibrin. But we can still diagnose this as evolving early lesion of leukocytoclastic vasculitis. So if we see this, we're going to call this early LCV, especially in the context of clinical. Now, if we do immunofluorescence on that, you'll see fibrin deposited. If you do PTAH stain, you can also see fibrin deposited, as you see here. So even though you can't see it with H&E, you can still see it with some of these special stains if you really want to confirm the diagnosis. A little bit later on down the line, the classic palpable purpuric lesions that we're used to seeing clinically here, we see the leukocytoclasia, the fibrin, and the damage of the blood vessel walls here. So this is pathognomonic of leukocytoclastic vasculitis. You can make the diagnosis quite readily without any, any problem when you see these kind of changes. And then later, you can get ulcers, late stage, burned out, end stage forms of vasculitis. You'll still see some uh, residual leukocytoclasia, some residual fibrin in some of the blood vessel walls, but these are when you see a very late stage lesion. Sometimes these lesions can be uh, vesicles, bully, ulcers, things of that nature. Now sometimes we'll see true urticarial vasculitis where we actually don't have any actual histologic features of urticarial vasculitis. This happens relatively rarely. 
but it is something that we see. Uh, patients are horrible historians in dermatology. Uh, they'll say, well, you, has the lesion been present for more than 24 hours? And they'll say, yes. They're often referring to the whole episode that may have been present for 24 days or 24 weeks. So they're not good historians. Uh, and they'll say that the lesions, usually these lesions are more painful than pruritic. They usually bruise with healing, but patients often rub and rub these lesions. They get secondary uh, bruising, so that's not specific either. Um, so this is something that we generally are going to need clinical correlation. You'll see hypocomplementemia and other things of that nature. It's usually associated with systemic uh, lupus erythematosus or an underlying you know, connective tissue disease. So the, this patient really did have urticarial vasculitis. These lesions really were present for more than 24 hours. He did have some bruising. He did have this diffuse urticarial type eruption. There is some cinerization around some of the blood vessels there, but there's really not much fibrin. So a lot of eosinophils in this infiltrate as well. So this guy did actually have hypocomplementemia and did have lupus erythematosus. But we really weren't able to see the fibrin in the walls of the blood vessels. So occasionally you'll see this without classic histologic features of, uh, of the fibrin deposition and the, and the thrombosis. Uh, the IgA mediated vasculitides, you're all probably familiar with some of these things. There is a childhood variant. And of all the forms of the vasculitides, these tend to give the greatest number of neutrophils and give you the greatest number of pustules. So if you see someone that has pustular vasculitis, you can probably bet it's probably going to be IgA mediated. Here's an example, obviously, palpable purpura. And then this is the childhood form, so-called Finkelstein's disease or acute hemorrhagic edema of infancy. They get these hemorrhagic edematous lesions often on the face and the buttock area, as you see there. Uh, histologically, you show the same other changes as you see with classic uh, leukocytoclastic vasculitis, but generally tend to be more neutrophils, and you may get pustular vasculitis. So here's an example of IgA-mediated vasculitis. If you do immunofluorescence in these lesions, usually within the first 24 hours, uh, you will see the deposition of IgA. So here you see it shows pretty much the same change of, of leukocytoclastic vasculitis, but IgA is positive, and this needs to be within about the first 24 to 36 hours. If it's much later than that, it degrades and you get a false negative. So you really need to get it kind of early on if you're going to make the diagnosis. Now, Wegener's granulomatosis, I think they've renamed this thing uh, microscopic polyangiitis. I don't like that name so much, but if you, if you still like the name Wegener, which I do, uh, you can get multiple different histologic uh, types of vasculitis with Wegener's. You can get small vessel vasculitis, large vessel vasculitis. You can get granulomatous vasculitis. And uh, what's interesting is the larger the vasculitis in the skin, the less the chance of systemic involvement. It's usually when they get small vessel involvement that they get lung, kidney, and the nasal involvement uh, associated with Wegener. So uh, you can get many of the different forms. You can get ulcers, papules, nodules. Uh, you can see either small vessel, the so-called Churg-Strauss granulum with the palisaded granulomas dermatitis that can simulate GA, and then the granulomatous vasculitis. These were a couple of patients that had these sort of relatively nonspecific uh, nodules, and notice also the, the livido reticularis like pattern. Usually when you see that in vasculitis, it's usually due to a larger blood vessel beneath the skin, as opposed to the small palpable purpuric lesions you see uh, when it's the smaller blood vessels involved. And this patient also had a lung lesion and had a pneumothorax. Uh, and so here's an example of a larger type of vasculitis associated with Wegener's. These, many of these, as you can see at this power, are pale cells or histiocytes. And you can see the diffuse involvement, the uh, multinucleated giant cell here, and then the involvement of the blood vessel over here, and then another area where this blood vessel is totally thrombosed, surrounded by granulomatous inflammation. If you see this, it's very characteristic of Wegener's uh, granulomatosis. So again, granulomatous vasculitis, you don't always have to have that, but if you see it, it's, it's very helpful. Now, lividovasculitis, there are really two kind of forms of this. One is associated with stasis change. Uh, in my experience, if you have someone that's got a stasis ulcer, if you look hard enough, you're going to see evidence of, of, of lividovasculitis in there somewhere. And that's clinically important because they actually respond to treatment with things like Plavix. Some of the antiplatelet drugs work beautifully for this disease. It's almost, uh, uh, it works in about 90% of cases in my experience. Uh, early on, they can get lividoverticularis. reticularis. It's often worse in the summer. Uh, you can get the palpable papules, but you'll often see these white cribriform changes. And then I'll show you what the histology looks like. You get these very thick wall blood vessels with lots of fibrin. So this is what we call atrophy blanche or lividovasculitis. Uh, this cribriform morphology here with the atrophy, very characteristic. And then later on, they get this white atrophic area that you see in this photograph. 
This is an example of this. You see, get the increased number of these very thick-walled stasis altered blood vessels with abundant fibrin both in the walls and in the lumen here. With relatively limited inflammation, you can get some leukocytoclasia. Um, it's not nearly as much as you see in classic leukocytoclastic vasculitis, but when you see this kind of pattern here with extensive fibrin in these blood vessels, uh, fibrin thrombi as well as thrombo fibrin in the walls of the blood vessels with stasis altered changes, it's really pretty much pathognomonic. And you can do a fibrin uh, immunoperoxidase stain that demonstrates uh, the presence of, of fibrin in these blood vessels uh, with immunofluorescence rather than not immunoperoxidase stain. Now thrombotic vasculopathy, a lot of people don't include this in the vasculitis category. Uh, here you're dealing with a situation where you get extreme uh, thrombosis of many, many blood vessels. These patients are often very ill. Uh, they may have DIC, it can be, uh, usually it's more diffuse and they can be associated with abnormal circulating paraproteins, drugs anticoagulants, they usually get a lividoid uh, purplish areas on their skin develop and then if you look under the microscope you get lots of thrombosis with extensive necrosis of the skin associated with it. Uh, these are the kind of patients, these are often uh, in the intensive care unit, uh, very ill patients. And if you do the biopsy, it can be relatively subtle sometimes. You look at it, you get minimal inflammation, and you see thrombosis of usually relatively small blood vessels. And sometimes there's material inside the blood vessels that's pinkish and amorphous, and that's the sign that you may be dealing with an abnormal circulating paraprotein when you see that. These patients need to be worked up to make sure they don't have lupus, lupus anticoagulant, Sneddon syndrome, one of those kind of uh, phenomena. Sometimes they're taking a drug. Uh, we see the same kind of changes with heparin necrosis. Uh, with patients with protein S, protein C deficiencies, they all can kind of give you these thrombotic vasculopathic patterns. So relatively minimal inflammation, extensive thrombosis, pretty serious uh, situation. Now lymphocytic vasculitis, way overdiagnosed. It's relatively rare. It's seen in only a few diseases. Uh, so again, mostly it's just perivascular inflammation with lymphocytes, it gets called vasculitis. So if they really don't have the thrombosis of the blood vessels and fibrin, it's really not lymphocytic vasculitis. So don't overcall it that. You wanna make sure it's gotta have the other criteria to make the diagnosis. We do see it occasionally in a few diseases, of epitoriasis like anoides. Again, you all probably know what the clinical features of that are. Uh, they get widespread scaly crusted papules. And then if you do the biopsy, you see the interface uh, dermatitis with epidermal necrosis and overlying perikeratosis. And occasionally you will see some true lymphocytic vasculitis. But again, it's relatively rare. Here's the epidermal changes with the extravasic erythrocytes. And this one blood vessel here does actually have some fibrin uh, in the lumen as well as in its wall with lymphocytes. So no evidence of any leukocytoclasia, no neutrophils. Uh, in this situation, it is a true lymphocytic vasculitis, but this is relatively uncommon. And unless you really see this kind of change, you really shouldn't call it lymphocytic vasculitis. So let's move from vasculitis into some other types of connective tissue diseases, uh, the sclerosing conditions. Uh, these are the conditions like morphia, scleroderma, eosinophilic uh, fasciitis, et cetera. These all have in common sclerosis, which is homogenization of collagen with a decrease in the number of fibroblasts, okay? That's a common histologic reaction in every one of these conditions. So looking at scleroderma, there are a lot of different uh, histologic and clinical manifestations of these conditions. They have these very, uh, you can get the, the people, they get the very thick sclerotic leaves of their face and hands. They get tightening and hardening of their skin. Uh, the crest form is generally milder. They get uh, telangiectasias and calcinosis cutis. Uh, ANA is positive in many of these patients, but they're different ANAs than they get in lupus erythematosus. The SCL70, for example, correlates with systemic involvement. They all have histology that's kind of similar to one another. Here you see the acrosclerosis, the pinched facies, the uh, inverse uh, pterygia there on the fingernails. So another example of those in that photograph. These are the mat-like telangiectasia, very characteristic of crest. And then the uh, calcification that's seen in patients that have the crest syndrome. Uh, morphia generally is limited to the skin. There are several different uh, clinical subtypes of morphia. Uh, and I'm showing you some of those. This is the kind of the pink lilac color that's seen in early inflammatory stage morphia. Uh, later on, there's some patients that get linear morphia. And notice in this patient, the, uh, this leg is smaller than the other one because if it happens in children, the bone gets deformed, doesn't grow properly. Perry Romberg, where they get a, a facial hemiatrophy, it's a type of uh, disease in the same category. The coup de sabre lesion, again, this is the same histologic manifestation as morphia or any of the other forms of scleroderma. And then the so called pansclerotic morphia, again, this is not a systemic disease, but they actually can sometimes die of obstructive pulmonary disease, restrictive lung disease, because they can't breathe, because they basically encase their entire uh, 
uh, chest cavity with thick sclerotic skin. If you look at this under the microscope, uh, if you get early lesions, you can get a lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate with some mast cells on occasion, and sometimes some eosinophils. You get the thickened collagen bundles, and then later you get the very thick sclerotic collagen bundles. Low magnification, you'll see this uh, biopsy that looks almost like a square, if you will. And this is all the thickened collagen bundles. Notice the lymphoplasmacytic aggregates in the lesion. Uh, again, the decrease in the number of fibroblasts here. There's almost no fibroblast here. Homogenization of the collagen with lymphoplasmacytic infiltrates, sometimes with the eosinophils. And it's and very characteristic to get these little nodules of lymphocytes and plasmids right at the periphery of the thick collagen bundles in the subcutaneous fat. So this is an example of kind of an early inflammatory stage of morphia. Later, you basically lose the uh, inflammation. You can get this salt and pepper-like dispigmentation, and if you actually uh, look for melanocytes in those areas, they're completely absent. It's sort of analogous to vitiligo, even though it's not really vitiligenous. And uh, this is an example of a late-stage burned-out sclerotic form of morphia or scleroderma. Now, I wouldn't know for sure looking at this what the clinical features are. This patient might have lung disease, kidney disease. They could have only just cutaneous disease localized. So histologically, they all look the same. You really have to have clinical correlation to define what type of scleroderma, uh, sclerosing process they have. Lichen sclerosis atrophicus tends to involve only the papillary dermis. So if you think of morphia involving the papillary dermis without the reticular dermis, you can think of it lichen sclerosis atrophicus. This can involve the glabrous skin, uh, also commonly involves the genitalia. And if you biopsy this, it shows this very edematous sclerotic collagen that's pretty much localized to the papillary dermis. If the reticular dermis is involved, we call it morphia with features of lichen sclerosis atrophicus if, it's, if both areas are involved. It's not uncommon to get thinning in the epidermis. You can also get follicular plugging in this condition, and you can get edema. It's going to actually be uh, bullous lichen sclerosis in some cases because you get massive papillary dermal edema, and you get an infiltrate generally of lymphocytes and plasma cells in here. Uh, there are several other diseases that can give you sclerosing processes. Uh, chronic graft versus host disease. Again, it can look virtually identical to chronic scleroderma or morphia. Uh, this patient had undergone bone marrow transplantation, developed this widespread scleroderma-like condition, and his histology looks pretty much identical. Uh, you may see sometimes interface dermatitis associated with that, but you don't have to see that. In this case, there was some vacuolar alteration, some interface dermatitis, because you can get interface dermatitis in graft versus host disease as well, but he does have the obvious extensive sclerosis of the dermis and still had some infiltrate, again, of some lymphocytes and plasma cells in there, like you can see with morphia or other forms of scleroderma. Eosinophilic fasciitis, this is uh, thought by many people to be a variant of scleroderma or morphia, only it's involving a deeper part of the skin and gets into the fascia. Uh, very commonly, you'll get this groove sign, which are these vertical linear depressions that follow the course of blood vessels between the uh, muscle groups. It may follow heavy exercise, but it also has been reported uh, in patients that take toxic oil in the eosinophilic myalgia syndrome. So this was contaminated L-tryptophan and toxic oil due to contaminated rapeseed oil a few years ago. It looks pretty similar to the other uh, condition. They get more systemic involvement in that. Here you see this, uh, the groove sign, these uh, areas involving, uh, following the blood vessels here, very characteristic in this condition. Another example here. And this uh, skin is very thick, woody, indurated. Uh, basically, you get this sclerotic hyalinized collagen that runs down in the fascia. Normally, your fascia should be very, very thin, more kind of like this, but these get very, very thickened and ultimately lead to the sclerotic collagen. And you may or may not have a lot of eosinophils in the actual biopsy. These patients very commonly have circulating eosinophilia associated with their uh, condition. But this one did have eosinophils plus the sclerosing collagen in the uh, septa there of the subcutaneous fat. Now, nephrogenic fibrosing dermopathy, this is not sclerosing, it's fibrosing. So here we have an increase in the number of, of fibroblasts, and it's often associated with gadolinium exposure, uh, usually in patients that have chronic renal failure that have undergone magnetic resonance angiography. Uh, they get this very thick skin with an increase in these uh, uh, fibroblasts, again, with some interstitial mucin. And you may see calcinosis within these lesions in these so-called lollipop structures. It looks similar to eosinophilic fasciitis. You get this kind of amoeboid morphology to the skin, very thick uh, uh, feeling skin. When you, when you palpate this, it's extremely thickened and wood, woody feeling. And if you look at it under the microscope, again, you get a marked thickening of the dermis. But here, as opposed to getting a decrease in the fibroblast, they're markedly increased in number. 
So this is a fibrosing process as opposed to a sclerosing process. And if you stain these with CD34, they'll stain very strongly positive. These are those little uh, sort of so-called lollipop structures. And if you look carefully within these, you'll see these little elastic fiber-like structures that have kind of a slightly grayish brown discoloration of them. That's due to the gadolinium that actually precipitates on those elastic fibers. And these little structures that often will calcify develop as a response to that. So this whole thing is just a, a response to this uh, abnormal gadolinium. And here you see those elastic fibers that actually have gadolinium within them in this condition. Interesting condition. We're not seeing as much of this anymore that they've stopped using gadolinium. Uh, Sclerotomyxedema, papular mucinosis, lactomyxedematosis, these are kind of a family of disorders. They all have an increase in the number of spindle cells with mucin associated with paraproteinemia in many cases. So you need to make sure if you get a patient that has this, you work them up to make sure they don't have underlying paraproteinemia. Um, the sclerotomyxedema type, basically is a widespread variant with markedly thickened skin. The papular mucinosis type are more papules and it's more similar uh, to the lichen myxedematosis type. There's a couple of other forms as well. So you get this very diffuse, thickened skin with leonine facies, with extensive proliferation of fibroblast. Uh, you get lots of mucin and elastic fibers may actually be decreased in this condition. So this guy had marked leonine facies, another couple of examples. Sometimes the, the skin gets so taut it doesn't look leonine anymore. They all really almost look analogous to patients that have uh, the La Bonita form of leprosy where they lose their wrinkles because the skin gets so thickened and sclerotic as in that case. And at low magnification here, you can, you can appreciate that there are cells between the collagen bundles. It almost looks like granuloma annulare at low magnification. Uh, these are fibroblasts and histiocytes that are oriented uh, kind of in a north-south-east-west orientation, a haphazard, busy dermis, if you will. And as you go to higher magnification, you can see these cells are, are present, uh, both oriented both vertically and horizontally in a diffuse pattern, usually in the upper to mid reticular dermis. And uh, if you were to stain these cells, again, they stain positively for CD34. This is the papular mucinosis or the lichen myxedematosis form. Again, same type of cells, and these often will have extensive amounts of mucin in the dermis, more so than sclerotomyxedema, although that can have mucin as well. These always have abundant mucin. And one form of this is the so-called acral persistent papular mucinosis. This is a, a benign form of this condition that may or may not be associated with paraproteinemia. And you can see that it's got an extensive amount of mucin with these increase in the number of fibroblasts. Now this, you can take a photograph of this if you'd like it, I believe it's in the handout. But this contrasts uh, the uh, nephrogenic fibrosing dermopathy with morphe and sclerotomyxedema shows the differences and similarities between the two. Uh, I won't go through this for you, but basically if you use these criteria that I've outlined before, you can generally make a diagnosis among these three without much difficulty. Now lupus erythematosus, uh, many different forms of this. There's a systemic form. Uh, there's a, a type with, uh, can be involved the skin alone with discoid lupus erythematosus. And the clinical criteria for LE, you can kind of read those there. Uh, again, you can tell these were drafted by a non-dermatologist, because dermatologists never use the word rash, they always use eruption. Uh, but basically, these are some of the things that you see when you're going to diagnose systemic LE. These are some of the clinical subtypes, and you can see there are many different forms, uh, uh, more than we'll get to all of them today. Um, if you kind of lump together acute neonatal and subacute lupus erythematosus, they all look histologically pretty much the same. So this is a condition where you really need clinical pathologic correlation to decide which form of lupus uh, you're dealing with. So drug-induced to subacute lupus erythematosus, again, may or may not resolve following discontinuation of the offending agent. Uh, hydrochlorothiazide, <clears throat> one of the more common causes. Uh, these are often rho positive and they're usually photo exacerbated. So here's an example of the classic form of acute lupus. You can see the, uh, the classic sparing in the nasolabial fold. This is a very helpful clue when you're dealing with someone with acute uh, systemic lupus erythematosus. Subacute lupus, the, uh, both the psoriasiform types and then the annular type, very characteristic there. If you look at these under the microscope, they show a very sparse infiltrate usually of lymphocytes with vacuolar alteration of the dermoepidermal junction, some thinning in the epidermis. But this is what you see in the real, in the acute forms. And this looks the same thing with acute LE as also with subacute LE. And even dermatomyositis can look very similar. This is what we'll talk about in a moment. So you really can't tell those apart from one another under the microscope. You really need clinical correlation. Immunofluorescence, the lupus band test, not a very good test. We really don't do that much in our laboratory anymore. The serologic testing is much better. It's more specific. If it's positive, it's helpful, but usually if it's positive, it's obvious clinically. So it's really not 
a great test. Superior, <coughs> we like to use serology more. If it is positive, you get this very dense, diffuse uh, granular deposition of, of multiple immunal reactants at the dermal junction. Now, discoid lupus erythematosus may or may not be associated with systemic disease. I usually get these well demarcated, slightly indurated discoid plaques on the scalp with follicular plugging. And uh, these are a couple of examples of patients with DLE. You can involve the scalp, you can get extensive uh, permanent scarring alopecia. Uh, the ear is commonly involved, the nose is involved. Sometimes, we talked about this in my earlier case this morning, it can simulate a neoplasm, it can look like squamous cell carcinoma if you, if you do a superficial shave biopsy of it. Uh, but the pathology is usually pretty straightforward if you get a, a, a reasonable biopsy. It's usually a superficial and deep infiltrate with lymphocytes, thickening of the base membrane zone, vacuolar alteration, and then follicular plugging and, and fully developed lesions. And so here you can see the classic features of, of, of chronic discoid lupus erythematosus. Uh, in the, the follicle involved there with the uh, thickening of the base membrane zone of vacuolar alteration. Now there's another form called the tumid form of lupus. This clinically and histologically looks like a lymphocytic infiltrate. Uh, immunofluorescence here is going to be usually negative. Uh, and if you see uh, these lesions pa in patients, they usually kind of look like a lymphocytic infiltrate, like Yesner's or a pseudolymphoma. If you biopsy these, they give you a superficial and deep infiltrate of lymphocytes. Sometimes some plasma cells may involve the subcutaneous fat. Some of these may have a little bit of lupus paniculitis associated with it, but it doesn't look like the other forms of lupus erythematosus because it really doesn't have any interface change at all. And if you do immunofluorescence on these, they're gonna be negative. Immunofluorescence in lupus, helpful if it's positive, if it's negative, even in patients that really and truly have it, it doesn't rule it out. So we get a lot of people that do immunofluorescence thinking it's going to kind of bail them out and they're not sure what the diagnosis is. Um, really clinical pathologic correlation is a better way to diagnose it than just relying only on immunofluorescence. Probably 20 to 30 percent of our cases when they have bona fide lupus have negative immunofluorescence. So I, I think it's good when it's, when it's positive, when it's negative it doesn't rule it out. Bullous lupus, uh, we see this on occasion. You get a subabnormal blister with neutrophils. It's similar to IgA, uh, linear IgA or dermatitis herpetiformis. Uh, we'll give you a positive immunofluorescence in most of these cases. Sometimes we see patients with bullous lesions, uh, so-called Rowell syndrome, which is a combination of erythema multiforme and lupus erythematosus. So this patient had uh, bullous lupus. Uh, these patients are often uh, ill. They've often been out in the sun or they've discontinued their steroids for some reason or other. They get a flare of the condition. And here you see it looks pretty much like uh, linear IJ bullous dermatosis or, or uh, dermatitis herpetiformis. They get a dense collection of neutrophils with a subepidermal blister beneath the uh, epidermis, as you see there. And this is the immunofluorescence, which was, was strongly positive. Now, the last uh, thing we'll talk about is dermatomyositis. Uh, basically, this is a, an inflammatory myopathy. Uh, there are two different peaks. It can be in the children or in adults. The adult type is often associated with malignancy, so you want to make sure that you uh, diagnose these patients. And they're associated with specific types of autoantibodies, PM1, JO1, et cetera. Uh, the cutaneous lesions, a lot of different cutaneous manifestations. I'll show you some examples of those. The so-called heliotrope eruption, looking like the uh, heliotrope plant there around the eyelids, face is commonly involved. The shawl sign involved the back of the neck and, and the, uh, uh, the back of the scalp. Uh, the V of the neck is commonly involved. Uh, you can get bullous uh, dermatomyositis with massive deposition of mucin, as you see in the center uh, picture there. Scalp is a common site of involvement. Uh, mechanics hands, they get this scaly crusted fish ring eruption that looks very much like uh, dyshydrotic dermatitis, only it's non pritic And then poikula dermatomyositis, you get poikuloderma uh, associated with dermatomyositis. So a lot of different clinical manifestations. You can get extensive calcification, uh, especially in childhood dermatomyositis. And you see this x-ray showing this massive deposition of calcium in this patient. Uh, the periangual telangiectasia, the streaking along the tendons, and the involvement directly over the knuckles, Gotrin's papules, very characteristic of dermatomyositis. Depending upon uh, which type of lesion you biopsy, you're going to see different types of histology. Immunofluorescence is virtually negative in all of these cases, so it's not really very helpful in dermatomyositis. So here's the histology, superficial perivascular infiltrate of lymphocytes. And notice how similar it looks to the lupus case I showed you a moment ago. So when you're trying to distinguish these two diseases histologically, it's not really helpful to do, you know, to do biopsies in many cases. It's really better to correlate the histology with the clinical.
If you biopsy a Gottron's papule, you would think that that should show some inflammation because there's erythema, there's involvement directly over the knuckles as you see here. But generally what these will give you, these types of lesions, is a very sparse infiltrate of almost limited inflammation at all. If there is any, it's, it's lymphocytic. And you see just a very sparse uh, dilatation of blood vessels, with a little bit of smudging around the blood vessels, a little bit of smudging at the dermal junction. This is a Gottron's papule. And this is very characteristic of what we see. It's not really very diagnostic at all. So you have to understand if you biopsy a Gottron's papule, this is what you're gonna see. You're not gonna see a very dense inflammatory inf infiltrate in spite of the fact that it looks sort of inflamed clinically. So again, if you look at these lesions together, dermatomyositis, lupus erythematosus, they may overlap clinically and histologically. Um, again, Gottron's papules look very subtle. The dermatomyositis and acral lupus can appear very similar. Uh, lupus, as opposed to dermatomyositis, involves the areas between the knuckles, whereas dermatomyositis likes to involve the areas directly over the joints. So again, these are acral lesions of lupus versus dermatomyositis, because notice that the knuckles are not involved here. The areas directly over are not involved, whereas they would expect it to be in dermatomyositis. And this is a biopsy of an acral lesion of lupus you really can't tell it from dermatomyositis, so it looks pretty specific. So be careful in guiding your clinicians down one path or another of these two diseases on biopsy alone, because they'll work the patients up differently. So we tell them that they can look very similar, they need to go back and do some of these serologic studies and correlate it with whether there's muscle weakness. Uh, Bechet's disease, just briefly, uh, this is a condition of oral aphthosis, genital ulcers, uveitis, uh, there are specific clinical and histologic criteria for the diagnosis of this condition. They often get eye involvement, cardiac involvement, uh, they get renal involvement, neural involvement. And uh, if you're going to make this diagnosis clinically, they generally have oral aphthosis plus either genital apathy, uveitis, and then these clinical lesions that are often papulopustular. And these often look pretty similar to the bowel associated dermatosis arthritis syndrome. Uh, sometimes cutaneous powder gangrenosum can kind of look similar to this. These are the, the genital and oral aphthiocene in, in Bechet's. These are the small papulopustular lesions that you see in Bechet syndrome. So this disease is, is quite difficult to diagnose clinically. Uh, it requires these specific symptoms, and histologically you'll see the neutrophilic infiltrate that's usually seen within the dermis, as you see here. Occasionally you get some secondary vasculitis, and you, this is one of the conditions where you sometimes can get a lymphocytic vasculitis as well. So this is one of the aphthous ulcers of, of Bechet's disease. So in conclusion, as kind of a, an overview of a lot of diseases. Uh, they're common, they're protean, uh, but if you use good clinical pathologic correlation, you can uh, usually make an accurate diagnosis, but you have to work together with your clinicians and with rheumatologists uh, to make this diagno these diagnoses appropriately. And don't use uh, immunofluorescence as a rescue. It's a helpful tool, but it's often not gonna totally bail you out when you're dealing with these conditions. So thank you for your attention, and uh, we are offering a uh, conference in Colorado next year. For those of you who obviously like to travel, you wouldn't be here in London. Uh, come visit us in uh, Beaver Creek, Colorado, and you'll get a much uh, more intense uh, experience and uh, a lot longer uh, time spent on, on conditions such as this in a beautiful setting. Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, <laughs> the time for maybe a question or two. Oops.